very thorough introduction. That's uh, <laughs> more thorough than I usually get. So thank you. Um, yeah, actually, now I'm 27 plus years as a regulator of void utilities, and it's taught me a few lessons. Number one, don't rely on the opinion of others. Do the hard work yourself to get the truth. It's okay to ask tough questions, number two. Number three, trust the experts, but verify the facts. So um, I'm showing uh, a link to our water board website, which has a fact sheet. And basically it says that the existing stringent state standards protect public health from COVID-19. Um, yet I'm personally gonna make some suggestions. I would clearly try to disclaim this by showing the material in underlying format. This disclaimer is due to the fact that we are in a pandemic and it's wise to be conservative since this is a new virus. As you can see, I'm a belt and suspenders type of guy. Now, DDW's focus is primarily drinking wastewater, but for recycled water, we're quite involved uh, indirectly through the, the regulations via the regional board permits. Now, we do set the regulatory health standards for wastewater use to protect the public. That can be found in what's called the water recycling criteria in Tab 22 of the California Code of Regulations. The nine regional water boards have the permitting authority. Now, we do review new and emerging treatment technologies, such as UV and others, and we issue letters with conditions on their use. Now, an expert at Berkeley recently stated, I'll let you read the quotes, but basically she's saying coronavirus has a structure that likely makes it easier to kill. So that's what we start with. And then we have that assumption. So while existing treatments are likely sufficient, we would like to see research that confirms this because this is a new virus. Then two weeks ago, uh, where there, there was a webinar with several highly esteemed experts. First, Krista Wigginton predicted 90% inactivation of common coronavirus at a very, very low UV dose of only 1.2 millijoules per centimeter squared. So that's extremely low, lower than most operators would do. Then Charles Hass asked the question that's all on our minds. Is this new virus as easy to kill as the ones we're familiar with? He didn't have an answer. Um, Charles Gerber followed up by suggesting we need to verify the effectiveness of chloramines and UV light on SARS-CoV-2. So I did some of my own work and I was directed to one interesting paper as shown here. Now it studied other viruses like COVID, SARS-CoV-2 that have envelopes. Now these are not the type of envelopes you'd want to lick. They studied what's called Phi-6 as a surrogate, as a model. It found that chlorine, it was easier to kill than MS-2. And MS-2 is the common way to test disinfection of viruses. Now for UV, they concluded it was similar to MS-2. Now based on this assumption, we are good if we bump our UV up by 20%. But that's just basically a model. I'm going to take you now into some of the science that we use to protect public health at the water board. Our UV dose requirements are intended to inactivate generic viruses in general. I'm getting a lot of tests, sorry about that. Um, Male specific bacteriophage has been a good theory because it is more resistant to UV than most other pathogenic viruses. Therefore, the National Water Research Institute UV guidelines utilize MS2 as our reference, to, reference pathogen. However, adenovirus is the exception. And if you 
operate in the safe drinking water world, that's uh, you should know that. Now, our recycled water regulatory goal is to kill five logs of virus. So with the help of a deep bed sand filter or anthracite filter, a dose of 100 should be fine, as you can see in the first row. Now, assuming a membrane filter is better, UV guidance suggests a dose of 80 should be fine. Note that some recycled water plants utilize conditionally accepted alternative filtration systems, such as the one shown here. That's a cloth media, and those are not as good on viruses as media filters. So you should be aware of that. Switch to the next slide. Oops, that's too far. Let me go back. Sorry about that. Okay, that's the slide I want to be on. So this graph uh, shows the dose response. This graph is from the 2012 NWI UV guidelines. So it provides an equation that provides the log kill as specific dose of MS2. And that was basically an average. Note that there is a lot of scatter based upon different labs that shows up in some variability. And then you have an upper bound and a lower bound. And so if you're within that bound, then you're okay. But that does provide different uh, responses. So just be aware of that. But we use the standard curve in, in the way we approve our UV systems. Now we reach the point where the skeptic in me comes out. Since this is a new virus, how can we be sure of the UV dose needed? Well, the good news is that only one other family of viruses requires more than MS2. So the existing standard should be fine. Still, as I stated previously in my disclaimer, I'm a public health engineer. It's my duty to be cautious. So if you are able, I personally suggest operating with a larger margin of safety. Now, every plant that's approved has to submit an engineering report, and part of that engineering report requires a contingency plan that ensures that no untreated or inadequately treated wastewater will be delivered to the use area. That means that there should be piping and valving in place to discharge off-spec water either to the headworks or to the waste. So each plant should plan and design for potential failures and make sure you have equipment to address these type of contingencies. I'm going to talk about redundancy and the picture shows an example of redundancy. Now redundancy is rationalized in the end of our guidelines theorizing that cystic components can be expected to fail at any treatment process from time to time. UV disinfection systems must be capable of producing disinfected recycled water during any component failure prior to distribution. So a minimum of two operating reactors per train ensures that some disinfection occurs until the standby reactor is brought online in the event that one or more of the online reactors fails. Let's talk about alarms. So some plants will typically set a what's called a low low UV alarm based upon the validated dose whereat if you're below that you divert to off spec water or shut down the plant at the minimum dose of either the 80 for membranes or 100 for media and then they will have in many cases what's called a low or warning alarm where the UV dose may be slightly higher maybe 5% 10% whatever now each plant should be able to set these uh, warning uh, alarms and change it by the operator. Should be easy to do that. Um, important of course is to make sure your intensity sensors, flow rate, and UV transmittance meters uh, are working. And if they're out of validated range, then something needs to be a response. Uh, notice the picture of the uh, fouled lamp. 
make sure you're maintaining your maintenance. You don't want to have sleeves like that where you can't get the photons to alter the DNA of the virus. UV systems are designed to react on the fly to input from their sensors. Operating to strictly meet the permit is fine, but I wonder if this is the time to be more conservative. Now we need to also talk about chlorine. We've had a lot of questions about chlorine and chloramines, and it's fair to talk about them as well as UV. There are some assumptions in our regulation we need to dig into. These are the strict regulatory minimums. Got to have a 450 CT, for example, a five milligram per liter residual at, after 90 minutes of contact time. And the minimum is 90 minutes, okay? And that has to be determined by a tracer test to determine the modal contact time. And that's typically done at the maximum flow. So inherently, there should be redundancy at lower flows for chlorine. A well-designed serpentine flow basin that, that has a theoretical average time of 120 may have a modal time of about 90, but that should be confirmed by a actual tracer test. The rigs are based upon a very old study that actually used polio in, in their demonstration. Nobody would ever use that nowadays. So they used an average contact time of 120. That's how we get to where we are. So that means the volume divided by the flow, say for instance, 60,000 gallons divided by 500 gallons per minute gets you 120 minutes. And then the study assumed that the serpentine channel had some short circuiting and applied the 0.75 factor to get to 90. And that's how we got 90 in our regulations. But the drawback is during the study, they only measured total residual. They didn't measure freeze clause residual. So the issue is that studies over the last decade have questioned the amount of kill. Many plants have very high levels of nitrogen in the form of ammonia coming from their secondary processes. This converts the free chlorine added to chloramines instead of free chlorine. Now the good news is that Free chlorine residual is possible. If you add enough chlorine, all the ammonia will be combined, and then the rest in excess will be free chlorine. So recently we've had a lot of requests to review studies on nitrified secondary water that is trying to get free chlorine. We used to require on-site demonstrations, but we've had enough of them that now we're accepting a CT table from Australia. Now, this is, was done by what was called the Water Val uh, National Study Group in, in Australia. And it was a very good study. So for instance, under the right environmental conditions, a free chlorine residual in a plug flow of water exposed to two milligrams per liter of free chlorine for eight minutes gets a four log kill. So it's pretty easy to get that if you get free chlorine. The other considerations I want to mention is the effectiveness of media filters has not been thoroughly demonstrated. Be aware of that. On the other hand, adding a coagulant has been demonstrated. So that's something to think about. Now the picture I show on the bottom right is a compressible fiber ball called a fuzzy filter. And it was uh, conditionally accepted. It can meet the turbidity standard of 2 NTU, but removing virus is not one of its strong points. So in summary, proper operation is essential, as that's true in any condition, but certainly during this pandemic, it becomes even more important. Must meet the requirements, but you may want to consider optimizing operations during the pandemic. Number three, process control alarms can be set at surrogate conservative set points, and many plants have extra capacity to do so. And finally, I want to make sure you understand, my comments are suggestions only for operations during this pandemic in order to be conservative. And here's my contact information and uh, my associate, Ray Bernard, chief of our recycle order unit, 
is also can be contacted. And our regulations can be found at that site, on the water board site. A lot of good information on that. Well, I'm done, Monica, or John. Thank you very much, Brian. And for the audience, we're going to go through questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Uh, what we're going to do now is move to our second speaker. And let me introduce Andy. Andy Selvason with Carrillo has 19 years of experience with environmental consulting experience serving the public and private sectors in research and design of water and wastewater treatment plant systems nationally recognized in re, uh, water reuse dis and disinfection, and provides Curlo's clients with guidance and expertise of the latest issues and technologies regarding reuse. And he has had a, led numerous planning, design, and research projects with various organizations, utilities, and corporations, and was honored uh, as the 2007 Water Reuse Person of the Year for bringing innovation technologies to the market. With that, it's my pleasure to present Andy. Andy, it's all yours. Great, thank you. I assume you can hear me. If not, let me know. There we go. Uh, so uh, I, I, you're gonna hear some similarities between Brian's presentation and mine. He and I have been working together for 20 years, uh, a lot of the time uh, on the same projects. And so we have a lot of thoughts in common. Uh, the uh, so let's start with a relative risk and just understanding where trying to understand where waterborne transmission fits in these four graphics starting in the top left and going clockwise uh, talk about the different exposure routes uh, respiratory transmission of course is a big concern as is fomite where you're touching surfaces that have the virus uh, fecal oral transmission is speculated at this point. I'll show some information shortly. Again, we're we're really focusing on waterborne transmission, whether that's in within the wastewater treatment plant, in an effluent for discharge, or in water reuse applications. Oh, sorry, I skipped too fast. Uh, there, uh, in preparing for this and in trying to answer our clients' needs. Uh, there is an overwhelming amount of information out there. It's coming fast and it's even changing. Uh, there are fact sheets uh, from around the world and within the United States and within California that are all useful. And uh, I, these, are, these can all be made available to attendees on today's webinar uh, if you're so inclined, starting with CWEA and WEF with a link at the top, Australia, World Health Organization in the middle, and some really interesting work in Las Vegas, Southern Nevada Water Authority. Um, these uh, websites and fact sheets provide useful information. Again, some of it uh, evolves. So what was thought to be true two weeks ago or a month ago may not quite be the case today. Uh, you'll find though some commonalities in these fact sheets. Uh, including that uh, starting off the top two bullets here, primary transmission is through sneezing, coughing, and secretions. It's not through exposure to water. Uh, uh, good high hand hygiene and behavior change is really critical. And, and then dropping down to some of these bottom bullets uh, that are important to understand. Appears that this virus <clears throat> does die off in several days on surfaces. It is uh, yeah, heat, high and low pH, sunlight, common disinfectants all facilitate die off. This virus appears to be less resistant to disinfection than most virus, which means that technologies such as free chlorine, chlorine dioxide, ozone, UV should be very effective, but it's all dose dependent. So you've got to know the dose that gets the right level of destruction. Uh, I wanna to go to some of the yellow highlights here. Existing standard approaches to protect wastewater treatment plant workers still apply, right? When we're at, the, at our wastewater plants, there's a lot of pathogens to be concerned about, not just this one, and doing your standard procedures to stay safe uh, should be effective towards this new virus. 
But again, uh, last bullet here, for pro there's a precautionary principle that's being encouraged in these fact sheets, which says that, look, there's still a lot we don't know. So minimize your exposure, in particular to untreated or partially treated wastewater. Just make sure you're wearing the right protective gear. Now on the right, there was a survey done in Texas, which was really interesting to me. And uh, I highlighted two of the bullet items. I'll read them in case you can't see them. 64% uh, of respondents have protocols requiring the use of PPE, so it wasn't 100%. And 42% of all respondents and 46% of government organizations have had trouble obtaining the right PPE that are in their protocols. Uh, So this uh, virus and the exposure risk does have some staff rattled. I work at wastewater plants. I was just at uh, one just a few weeks ago for a week. Uh, there are concerns out there. Uh, this is a quote from a public works director, assistant director in Omaha, Nebraska, but I think it applies to a lot of people. And I'll just read these three bullets. Um, they are referencing the literature out there. And he says, while it states that there's nothing proven that it being the virus can survive, there's also no proof that it can't. Uh, there's hysteria that comes in waves with his staff and it's getting harder for this uh, assistant director to assure his staff that in no way, are, he says, are we putting them in harm's way and having them continue to work in the collection system? So that there is absolutely a need for good solid information to demonstrate the, uh, that with the right level of care, it is uh, safe not only to work at these wastewater plants, but to uh, be exposed to the effluent. And we believe that it is safe. Uh, highlighting some of the different ways though of exposure, aerosols as you walk the plant. Uh, there's a couple photos of me here, direct contact with the wastewater as part of sampling efforts, for example. Uh, and, but maybe again, the biggest risk item is exposure to other people uh, working at a plant. Sometimes it's hard to maintain your distancing. There are good operational safety considerations uh, that are out there, a document by Mark LeChevalier. Again, these materials can be provided to the webinar attendees. Uh, this is a, a publication by Mark LeChevalier and others, which does go through and say, what do they recommend in terms of PPE uh, for wastewater treatment workers in general? Okay. And uh, it talks about uh, different types of coverings, very useful. There's been a call to action, let's gather data. It's not a call to alarm, it's a call to action. Uh, and so this was an article by Krista Wigington as one example. And it's saying, look, let's get more information. We feel pretty comfortable that this virus degrades easily and can be disinfected and removed well, um, but let's gather more information. Let's get information on the fomites, that's the transmission through solid surface, uh, contact surfaces. Let's get information on the disinfectants under real world conditions. As Brian mentioned, Chuck Gerba had a similar request. Uh, and let's start looking at uh, concentrations of this virus in sewage, raw uh, and effluent. So, so what do we know about the virus? And again, this evolves uh, rapidly. Uh, there's uh, start at the top. There's been recent work in the Netherlands it's frequently cited, but they have not shown um, concentrations in the effluent from wastewater plants. They're finding it on the influent. The levels are anticipated to be at or below levels of other types of enteric virus. Uh, to date, some of the RNA results are positive, um, but there is very limited data only to indicate the presence of viable virus in stool samples. So there are people that question, is this virus even able to, able to survive and be cultured uh, through the GI tract, uh, let alone through a wastewater plant? So that remains to be determined. Uh, there's some of the data does show about 10,000 gene copies per liter. This is the RNA. Uh, again, the Australians are doing work as well. So there's work in uh, a number of places around the country and around the world. On the bottom, uh, Dan Garrity, a recent presentation he just did, he's at Southern Nevada Water Authority. So far, all the SARS uh, CoV2 are non-detect in secondary and tertiary effluent. Now again, those are RNA studies looking at gene copies. University of Arizona has found the virus in raw wastewater, but again, not in the secondary effluent. 
So there's good reasons to be optimistic, but we should be cautious as well. Uh, so now let's talk a little bit about uh, exposure and risk. I'm going to start with the far end of advanced treatment for potable reuse. There are risk documents out there, a uh, number of them, one of them by the Water Research Foundation, which explains the levels of a broad range of virus in secondary effluent and the ability to purify that water and remove the virus uh, so that there is a very limited level of risk. Uh, and so we feel pretty comfortable about the abilities of potable reuse systems to deal with any pathogen, including this new one. For non-potable reuse, there is not a risk-based approach that is applied in California. Uh, we have our 2.2 total coliform and our 5 log virus standard, uh, but there is a movement towards risk-based analysis for non-potable reuse systems. And so I show on this slide here some log removal targets. For potable reuse, we have very high log removal targets, 12 log reduction of virus, for example, 10 log GRD and crypto. For this non-potable work, the log removal numbers are a lot less. Um, and it's important to understand, though, that different technologies will give you different log removals, whether they're filtration systems, deep bed filters, continuous backwash, disk filters, membrane bioreactors, et cetera and different, different, different performance of disinfection systems. And I'll talk about that momentarily. But I wanna do a step back for just a moment and acknowledge that there are some large differences in the levels of tertiary treatment between an effluent discharge application and a water reuse application. Uh, so let's start with, I think we have a poll question. I'll turn this back over to Monica, I believe. I don't believe we can hear you, Monica. So, so since I can't hear Monica, I will continue to MC this. Uh, it, so we do want you to try to fill out this poll question. What filtration technologies do you use? And mark all that apply. We'll wait for your response for a moment. We did get, as you fill that out, we did get, of course, your responses on the disinfection technologies, and I found those very interesting. Uh, we had, I'll just refresh them verbally as you log in your numbers here. We did have a high level of people using uh, chlorine and sodium hypochlorite for disinfection. Uh, there was about uh, all, more than a third used UV disinfection. And then we had some other boxes, which were interesting. Of course, we had no disinfection. We had other, I'm curious to know what that is at some point, chloramines and uh, ozone. Okay, there we go on the filtration systems. And let's just uh, take a moment and uh, I just wanna stare at that for a second. So what we've got is uh, a, a good number of sand filters, not surprising. Membrane filtration has a high percentage. Uh, and uh, and then some cloth filters, uh, MBR. Okay, so uh, Monica, if you could close that out and, and hand it back over, I'll take over. Okay. I'm going to be, there we go. All right, so let's talk for a moment though about the difference between effluent discharge in the left column and non-potable water reuse. And let's start with uh, the goal. Uh, so typically, effluent discharge systems are not focused on broad level pathogen removal. They're focused on meeting compliance targets for bacteria. And depending on the technologies you use to kill the bacteria, they have different levels of virus uh, destruction ability, all right? So there's typically no virus standard. And that drives us towards what's the most efficient way to kill bacteria. Um, as we go left to right for non-potable reuse, uh, we do have non-detect uh, total call for numbers, but also five log virus standards. And you'll see that for a lot of the technologies we use, as I show later, uh, those disinfection systems are very effective. Um, now, uh, to go down to the bottom, effluent discharge may or may not be filtered. 
It all depends on other MPDES requirements. Uh, and, and filtration is a really good idea ahead of disinfection so that the disinfection systems are more effective. Essentially, the solids, very small amount of particles, even from a high quality secondary effluent, those particles can interfere with disinfection. And so Water Reuse says in California, let's get those particles out, make the disinfection most effective. Uh, so there are real differences between the filtration and disinfection systems that may or may not be used based upon if you're doing effluent discharge or water reuse. So let's talk a little bit. Brian went through some of this and I'll try to go through it relatively quickly. Uh, the removal of virus through conventional treatment. And so in this table, we show conventional primary and secondary treatment, which may remove between 90% and 99% of virus. Could be a little less, unlikely that it's a little more. Uh, membrane bioreactors though, and this data is, uh, is at the forefront of research right now. We're showing membrane bioreactors not only getting 99% removal of virus, but higher levels, 99.99, as long as those turbidity criteria is being met by the membranes. And we see that with a well-maintained MBR, they, they really are being, meeting those criteria. So MBR is uh, a substantial increase in pathogen removal, in part because of the membranes uh, and the combined biological removal processes. Tertiary filtration though, for, uh, for most wastewater filters are not robust at virus removal. Now, if you're doing deep bed sand filters with coagulation, chemical addition, then yes, you can improve your virus removal, but very few wastewater utilities operate their wastewater filters in this manner. They're being operated to meet turbidity criteria only. Uh, UV systems, it all depends on the dose. And I have some greater than numbers because there's uncertainty right now. As Brian presented, we expect this new virus to very, be very susceptible to UV disinfection. We expect high log removals, but there's research that needs to be done to confirm all our expectations. Free chlorine in the middle, very effective at virus removal. As Brian mentioned, I wanna point out that chloramination not nearly as effective as free chlorination for virus kill. High CTs may be necessary. As we look at alternative disinfectants, there's several out there, and I, uh, so I several out there, and I highlight uh, three of them: uh, ozone, very effective at virus kill; pasteurization, uh, very effective at virus kill. These are both Title 22 approved in California. Paracetic acid, maybe not so much. There's mixed results. And it is, paracetic acid is not Title 22 approved compared to the other systems shown on this uh, graphic. So I'm gonna put it all together and close up here with uh, uh, two slides. First is, uh, you know, some recommendations, right? Wh wear your PPE that's recommended by your wastewater utility when you're working within the plant. Uh, the CDC has come out and said that it's a good idea to wear masks uh, to minimize exposure to each other. Uh, I support that personally. You know, when I'm out at wastewater plants, I want to put on a mask and, and limit that respiratory transmission. Uh, understand where risk is greatest, right? Uh, raw wastewater within the plant going left to right here, effluent discharge and water reuse. This far end, uh, tertiary recycled water, we have a lot of confidence that risk is pretty minimal um, as one example. I do want to highlight that, and, and Monica can send this out, FEMA EPA is sending 200,000 masks to California for wastewater agencies. And there's a way to get on the list and get yours ordered. Last conclusion slide here. Uh, it's important to know what you've got at your plant. Uh, what are the processes and how good are they at broad level pathogen removal? And then at the bottom, be a part of the solution by helping us collect data. Uh, as one example, Dan Garrity, I put his email up there. He's looking for wastewater utilities to send him samples. You know, I encourage us to do that so we can better understand the concentrations in raw wastewater and the concentrations in uh, secondary effluent and uh, tertiary effluent. Anyways, I believe that's my last slide. I'll turn it back over. Thank you. Contact information shown here.
John, you might be on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Apologize. For the member audience, I just a couple uh, housekeeping items. If there are some questions that you have for any of the speakers, uh, could you please utilize the Q&A function on the Zoom uh, website? With that, I'd like to introduce our third speaker, Ben Swartz with Trojan. Uh, ben has been a senior field service specialist for Trojan and has, been, has worked for Trojan for 28 years. This audience has got some pretty good uh, uh, speakers today. He has served in various capabilities, including at an engineering team leader and technical trainer. Ben graduated from industrial electronic control program uh, out uh, from Beishwa College in Applies Arts and Technology. He holds an elect electrician construction and management certification endorsement and electronic controls from the Ontario College of the Trades. We wanted Ben to be uh, on this call because he provides both operations side and vendor technology side. With that, I'm going to hand the reins over to you, Ben. Oh, excuse me. We do have a poll question. Monica, if you want to go ahead and get that up on the screen for the audience. Uh, we wanted to get an idea specifically for Ben. Uh, what is your single biggest challenge at maintaining and servicing your UV system? Um, if hopefully um, you don't, but if there are issues, we'd like you to look, read the poll question, answer it, and then we're going to have the uh, response in just about 30 seconds. Okay, Monica. Okay, so it looks like per uh, Brian, I get, I'm glad that Brian went through uh, beyond UV because we've got a, a big significant folks that don't have a UV system. So typically it's keeping them clean. All right, I appreciate your time on that. With that, I'm gonna hand the reins over to uh, Ben and to have him walk through his presentation. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate it and appreciate the time to be able to go through this. Make sure I can get over to the next slide. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about is um, how to basically keep your UV system running as, uh, as best as possible. So just a few of the topics we're going to go through are safety, some notes about operation and maintenance, uh, preventive maintenance schedule, uh, troubleshooting, and then warranty and support. So um, the safety precautions, of course, uh, in light of COVID-19, we, we've got some other things to consider, but uh, these are just the usual ones whenever working with a UV system. So you've got your UV light hazard, and I think we've got another slide that talks about that in a little more detail. Uh, any UV system, is an electrical system so make sure that whenever you're working on the equipment that you follow the proper lockout and takeout procedures as well uh, depending again on the uv system and whether it's got some sort of a lifting mechanism or maybe you've got some uh, third party uh, winch or hoist or something you just want to make sure that you consider things like slips trips and falls and also, um, again, oftentimes when you're working on the equipment, you need to access an open channel. So make sure that you're wearing the proper PPE for that. Uh, again, depending on what uh, type of system you have, it could be open channel, it could be a uh, closed vessel. There could be uh, burn hazards. So some, of, some of the closed vessel systems uh, can run hot at low flows on the outside. And they can also be pressurized as well. So make sure, again, whenever you're considering locking out equipment, it's not always just electrical. There might be other forms of energy that you need to lock out. 
And then, of course, working in wastewater, there's always going to be uh, biological hazards, uh, COVID-19 being the one that we're talking about today, and also potentially chemical hazards. Uh, UV lamps uh, use a small amount of mercury, so make sure that you've got a mercury spill kit uh, if you need it. UV light safety. So when, with any UV system, the, the key rule is make sure you don't look at the light. Um, also making sure that you're not just covering your eyes, but any exposed skin as well. Uh, even if you're wearing the, the right PPE, again, you can consider that um, when you're wearing safety glasses, and I have prescription safety glasses whenever I, whenever I work on a piece of UV equipment, and uh, it can be tempting to look at uh, what some call the pretty blue lights, but you really want to make sure that you don't look at them. As far as operating the system goes, um, and again, maybe this is just common sense, but keep the lamps on. So it really helps to keep your system operating, keep as many lamps on as uh, are required to be on. And it also really helps to make sure that your system is running in automatic. I've seen uh, plants and been at plants where sometimes they'll run part of the system in auto, but they've got the other part turned off and the equipment typically doesn't like that you either turn everything in auto or you turn everything into manual. And when it's in auto and all of your inputs are working properly, the UV system will make sure that it's delivering the, uh, the correct dose that uh, the system is designed for. Um, the UV intensity of the lamps decreases over time. So another thing to consider is that you replace your lamps when they reach the end of lamp life to ensure that the system's delivering the proper UV dose. Keeping your system clean is really, really important and that includes keeping the sleeves which can foul, uh, maintaining them and keeping them as clean as possible. Um, a lot of our UV systems have an automatic cleaning system and that's a mechanical and chemical cleaning system and making sure that that's maintained so that it can keep the system uh, clean or if you've got one that uh, has mechanical only cleaning or doesn't have a cleaning system, you might have to pull the lamps or the modules out of the water and clean them manually. But you really want to make sure that you maintain them and keep them clean. Something that's uh, just a note to keep in mind, it really helps to inspect your sleeves when they're dry. Because sometimes when they're wet, they look like they're very clear. And it's when you, they dry that you see the film that might uh, be formed on them that blocks the uh, UV light. Not just the sleeves itself, but keeping the entire system, and that includes the channel clean, really helps. We've got some pictures here. These are uh, not ideal conditions. You can see that there's uh, algae and other buildup on some of the components. So it's important to, to regularly check your system. Things like low water level sensors especially, um, that's a safety item so that if the water level does drop, your UV system will turn off so that there isn't the risk of UV exposure. But uh, you want to make sure that you don't have debris that will give your low level sensor a, a false reading that the level is good. You want to make sure you keep the components dry. So again, we've got electrical and electronic components uh, that are near water. And um, you want to make sure that your enclosures are, are dry. Something to keep in mind as well is things like O-rings and gaskets. They are considered consumable. So when you're doing lamp changes, as an example, it's a really good idea at that time to replace the O-rings. And even gaskets for some of the major components um, like our power distribution centers, just inspecting them at least annually to make sure that they, they look good so that they're going to survive the outdoors. This is just a, um, an example of a preventive maintenance uh, schedule that you would see in one of our O&M manuals. So again, it's something to make sure that you're familiar with, that you go through your O&M and you do those uh, daily, weekly, monthly checks to make sure that the system is maintained as well as it can be. And then when it comes down to troubleshooting, these are just some of the, the basics anytime you're working on a piece of equipment. Um, 
you really need to have a good knowledge of how your UV system uh, should work and um, make sure that you are familiar with the operation maintenance manual. Remember that UV systems are modular. So oftentimes if you have a fault, it's pretty straightforward in, in maybe two, three or four steps, you can really narrow down what the root cause of the problem is, whether that's a lamp or a communication fault or something that's electrical. So just do the, the, uh, the checks, do one thing at a time. Um, I used to work for quite a few years in technical assistance and sometimes we get calls and someone's said, well, I had a problem. So I tried, you know, A, B and C and D all at the same time. And uh, it just makes things a little more complicated than it needs to be. So try to use uh, a straightforward method and uh, write down as you're going along. There's a, an example of a troubleshooting chart that, again, we would have in our O&M manual. So if you are going through and you're doing some troubleshooting, like, for instance, a lamp failure, um, go through the go through the O&M manual, it's uh, got a pretty straightforward uh, table to, to uh, let you know how to troubleshoot. We have a warranty claim form. And again, I'm sure not just Trojan, but other UV manufacturers would as well. And this is something that is probably underutilized by a lot of customers. And uh, by using the warranty claim form, you're going to save yourself money because if the lamps or drivers or ballasts, I should say, are under warranty, you might as well take advantage of that. So as soon as you have a, a failure, it's great to go down, record it, where it was, what the failure was, especially if it's something that's recurring and you have multiple operators at a plant, uh, you could have a problem spot that you're not aware of. And by recording it, you'll see if there's uh, any repetition to the actual failure itself. And, um, and then again, if you've got uh, failed components that are under warranty, it's better to call us sooner than later. Um, again, I've had customers who have stockpiled lamps and then they call five years after the fact saying, hey, I've got a bunch of lamps that are under warranty, but they've got no record of it. So it's hard for us to honor that warranty if it's not recorded. This is a question we get a lot is, uh, so what is the recommended uh, service stock? And um, it's one of those things where, you know, what do you really want to stockpile? So these are just rules of thumb, and this can vary from plant to plant. And again, I know that there's a lot of municipalities that run uh, more than one wastewater plant, and they may have multiple UV systems that share parts, so then they can benefit from that as well. So a good rule of thumb would be about 5 to 10% of uh, your lamps to have on spare and that's just for intermittent lamp failures. As far as the, the lamp drivers go, maybe two to three percent of your lamp drivers are ballasts, five to ten of the quartz sleeves. And then if you've got any things like circuit boards, um, we say you know maybe two to three percent to have again on hand. O-rings are also a very good thing because again, consider them to be a consumable. So anytime you change a lamp, you really should uh, replace the O-ring. And then if you've got a cleaning solution like our ActiClean gel or, or whatever you might use to, to clean it, make sure that you've got enough on hand so that you can either do a full replacement to recharge the cleaning system or to do a full cleaning if you're doing manual cleaning of your UV system especially if you have something like a plant upset, it's uh, really good to, uh, to make sure that you've got that on hand so that you can respond quickly. Um, a note at the bottom of this, if your lamps are getting near the end of life, um, and again, depending on your system, we have systems that are 12,000 hour or 15,000 hour for the end of life. It's a really good idea to have those replacements on hand before they get to the end of life. So as they're nearing it, so that when it's time, you're ready to do your lamp change. Uh, this is something that um, is near and dear to my heart as well. And this is the question of, do I use genuine lamps from the manufacturer or should I put in the aftermarket non-OEM lamps? And at the end of the day, it's always going to be the customer's decision what they want to do. But just something to keep in mind, especially as we're trying to deliver a specific UV dose with any of our systems, is that has been 
third party validated using our lamps or again, for any manufacturer, it's using their lamps. As soon as you put a non-OEM lamp into your system, um, we can no longer guarantee the performance of the UV equipment. We provide a lifetime performance guarantee for all of our UV systems. And once you put those non-OEM uh, lamps in, we don't know what the output is. We're not sure what the performance is going to be or if you're going to be delivering the dose that was validated. And we also don't know what impact it's gonna have on any of the other equipment. So are those lamps compatible with the ballast or are they gonna cause premature failures? We really don't know. And then finally, uh, contact support. So again, Trojan has um, a technical assistance center and uh, we're available um, 8 to 5 p.m. is when we're actually staffed, but we do have people that are available for after hours uh, support. So really 24 seven, if you ever have a problem or a question, we've got um, all of the access to uh, the, your equipment, your specific equipment information and uh, the specialists are on hand to, uh, to help you through it. And I think that's um, it for my presentation. Excellent, thank you, Ben. Uh, once again, we'd like to, um, that we're gonna go into Q and A. Uh, Kevin talked about the advanced water treatment operator certification. And just as a reminder, that's at awtop.org. We've got, we only have a few questions, so I'm gonna do a combination from questions from the Q&A and then questions that were, was provided when everybody signed up. So um, the first question is gonna be probably a combination of Brian and Andy directed to you. The question is, to what degree is regular monitoring for pathogens currently in place at wastewater treatment plants, if at all? That's a very broad question. Well, so just this Brian, is Brian. Is first, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, so our, our current regs uh, require daily total coliform monitoring. So there's no exception to that. Uh, so that, that's basically, you know, either for chlorine or UV, it, it, it's like a warning that something's happening and, and it's based upon the median seven day numbers, you know, 2.2 uh, for tertiary disinfectant. And uh, you can't go over 240, you know, so, so there is some flexibility there, but you have to do that daily. And um, with UV systems, I think Andy would admit, you know, elaborate on sometimes that's a, that's a signal that you need to clean your channel. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, uh, just to add on to what Brian said, is, is, you know, I, I, I don't expect whether it's in California or nationally there to be um, pathogen monitoring requirements in effluent. It's very expensive. Um, there may be some utilities that want to move forward with their own testing for their own information. Uh, I will say that uh, there has been a movement for the last probably 10 years to refocus the goal of disinfection right, to be not just about bacteria, but about virus, about protozoa uh, removal. And I, I think that this outbreak will have some, uh, it'll have, it'll, it will push that conversation faster. Uh, so there may be uh, goals to improve pathogen disinfection ability uh, that could be done independent of having to do very expensive pathogen surveys in secondary effluent. Excellent, thank you both. Uh, next question is actually is for Ben specifically. Um, is there and the question is is there any problem between the UV system and high iron and magne magnesium ions content in water? Hi, uh, Ben here. So yeah, um, as far as iron goes, the um, iron is going to have a tendency to uh, to coat the sleeves. I'm not. To be honest, I'm not the expert on magnesium and I'm not a chemist either, but um, as long as you're maintaining your sleeve cleanliness, so again, we use um, an Accutane gel 
that does a really good job of maintaining that cleanliness so it dissolves the iron. Um, if you've got a system that doesn't have uh, an automatic cleaning system, that just might mean that you need to more frequently pull your uh, modules or your lamps up and clean those screws manually using something like a phosphoric acid solution. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, this one, the combination of came into the Q&A, but also was one that um, was provided during registration. I'm going to use one of them as the go by. Uh, the question is probably going to be going first to Brian, then to Andy, just for some balance. Uh, the question is, can coronavirus become airborne around aeration basins? And the second question or hybrid of that was around basically fine bubble diffusers. Brian, you still there? I am here, but I, uh, I don't have any good answer to that question. Okay. So, so I can point to the literature here, and there's, there's unknowns. I tried to type up an answer to this as well. There is evidence that this virus can, be, can remain in aerosol form for a good amount of time. I, I have to go back through the literature to see how many minutes that is. Uh, and there is evidence that the RNA of the virus is in raw wastewater. Um, so, uh, what, so what does that mean? right? Uh, we don't really know the answer to the question. Uh, it may be that the RNA could get into an aerosolized form. It does not mean that it's a culturable virus that could infect. Um, so we have to, so studies would have to be done to make a, a clear link and to explain that there is a real risk there. Uh, some of the work that I read, some of the literature suggests that as a precautionary principle, you know, that we don't know yet about aerosols. And so try to limit, you know, of course, inhalation of aerosol, partially treated wastewater aerosols. Uh, that was one of the suggestions that was made. As a follow-up, Andy, and you just said partially treated, is that correct? So i.e. during, uh, within the treatment plant itself, but not necessarily finished recycle water afterwards? Yeah, I haven't read about concerns of aerosols in like a tertiary recycled water. You're irrigating a golf course or something like that. I haven't read about in the, in from the different researchers out there that they're worried about that. Um, and again, if you're doing a good level of filtration and disinfection, I think you can feel even more comfortable about that risk element. Understood. Um, next question, it's, it's kind of a doubled up uh, from Veolia and San Francisco PUC. Brian, the question is to you, because um, it's, a, it's a hybrid off of one of your uh, slides. It, uh, for a wastewater treatment plant, or in San Francisco PUC's case, a non-potable system that has less than a 90-minute de uh, detection time, a DT, what is in your opinion, what is the minimum safe level for uh, UV and total chlor chlorine disinfection for systems such that don't meet the 450 t uh, CT? Yes, so uh, thank you. I saw that question. And um, again, it's, it's very important to determine whether you're in the free chlorine mode or the chloramines. Now, now, now you, you could have both. and, and I, I've seen data where, you know, you, you, you use your hot equipment and you actually find total chlor chlorine and free chlorine. The, the free chlorine might be a little. And remember, it just takes a little free chlorine to uh, kill the viruses, whereas chloramines, it's several orders of magnitude more to kill the uh, virus. So that, that's real important to know. Um, and, and so... Uh, that's why you know, I wanted to point out, you know, not only do we need to think about UV, but chlorine. And uh, a lot of plants uh, don't handle their ammonia very well. But if you are able to get to free chlorine, then um, like I showed in my example, it, you know, CTs under 20 typically are very effective. 
for killing all the all the viruses we know about, you know, the MS2 and others. So so it's, it's very uh, very easy to kill with free chlorine. So if you can get to that, good. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, we, we, the 450 is still part of our reg for total chlorine. We are accepting alternatives now, as I mentioned, and a lot of people have gotten approval for that, and we keep getting more and more uh, people. But um, the easiest way, of course, is to have good secondary treatment where you're nitrifying. Um, and so that's, uh, th th that'll deal with your ammonia. So I hope that answers the question. Okay. A slight uh, hybrid question, uh, Brian, along those lines. Um, once again, you may not know, or we may, we may not know, but it will, um, between you and Andy, the question is, how sensitive is coronavirus dis, uh, disinfection to pH specifically? Yes, it is. And so, um, you know, I, I showed the table, but of course it was too small to read. So, right. That's why I'm re-asking the question. You bet, Brian. Thank you. Sure. sure. Uh, so if you go to, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the reference, and I believe Alec showed that reference, um, and the, the, the Australians uh, were able to distinguish between several factors, three of them, turbidity, pH, and temperature, and all three have a relative importance. But if you're in the typical range of under 2 NTU um, and your temperature's 20 Celsius, typically, I understand that most, uh, most recycled water is about 7.5, uh, you should be able to you know, inactivate a lot at CTs under 10. Um, now, if you end up being above 7.5, according to the table, you, it's actually you have to be 33% higher, and so you're more into the uh, uh, over 10. So that that does have an impact. Um, I, I I don't know how many people uh, report their pHs, so I don't have a good idea. The ones that have reported to me indicate that they're always under seven and a half, so that's good. Um, you can have a lower CT. So it does have some impact, but again, they're at really low numbers. So I, I would su suggest you go to that reference and take a look at that. Okay. Um, this one, it's a, it's a PPE question. Um, uh, Andy, you, you kind of wrap your wrap up slide kind of touched on it. Um, it's been asked both at the registration and in the Q and a right now. Um, I'll read the one particular question. Uh, I'm confused about whether there is an official recommendation for POTW staff working at or near basins to wear masks or not? Is this something that could be enforced or is it at the discretion of the operators? Hard question, but it's more and more of an opinion, but can I, can the audience get your advice? Yeah, I, so, so I, I'm not really in a position to make an official recommendation based upon, uh, you know, uh, all the wastewater plants across the state. So um, I think that the, the different things that I've read is all I can pass along and just repeat here, which is that until we know more, uh, it's good to follow a precautionary principle. And, and that's, that's, that's what I tell my staff when we're working at plants is right now, um, my, I'm mostly worried about person to person ex exchange of the virus. So I'm telling my staff wear, wear a mask if you can get a good mask that is, uh, you know, like the N95, if you've got some, uh, we actually had some because of the fires in California. Uh, so anyway, so I, I, I apologize. I'm not, I'm not able to, and I shouldn't be issuing any kind of an official recommendation. Uh, maybe that's something that we could follow up on with CWEA. Correct. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, next question is, uh, I think this one's more for Brian and Andy. We're going to start with Brian. Is there an update regarding getting LRV credits for MBR wastewater treatment? So let me start. You know, uh, that's uh, been a question that uh, 
again, we've been fairly conservative because we know in the clean water um, operation, um, when you don't, when you have clean membranes, uh, you get very little virus removal, not even a full log. So we've been very careful to uh, move toward how much we get in wastewater. And in the clean water, everybody's required to do direct integrity testing. And uh, I have to just add a personal note. I've been around, you know, 25 years plus. And I remember years ago, the member manufacturer says, yeah, we'll, we'll do the direct integrity testing in wastewater. Well, years later, I find out, no, they're not really doing that. So if you can do a direct integrity test, that's the best way to determine you've gotten virus removal. Um, if you... Uh, you've got intact membranes, which might get some virus removal. Now, the other thing is the Australians have come up with a way, and so we have been accepting, if you if your turbidity is always under 0.2, uh, you get one and a half log removal of virus. And so that's, as Andy has pointed out, that's lower than he's showing in his studies. And uh, we're waiting for the final results of his research study to go any higher. There's also studies being done by Metropolitan Water District and other districts that are looking into that. So it's a very hot topic, and uh, stay tuned. Yep. So, so I'll just I'll just add to that uh, the Water Research Foundation work um, that we're wrapping up uh, is going to is coming forward with recommendations on the log removal values, which will find their way to Brian. Uh, and we are expecting to wrap that report up in the next few months. Excellent. Thank you both. Uh, to the uh, answering the previous question with regards to PPP, PPE, I'd uh, ask the audience members to look at your screen and Alex has posted up implementing the hierarch hierarchical of controls for wastewater protection, worker protection. Um, that's something we can share, but I wanted to direct the audience to look at your screen on that PPE question. Um, next question I'd like to share, um, and this is more of an operation question, so I'm gonna, it may be a combination of all three speakers. Um, what I'll do is I'm gonna su suggest, Andy, you're gonna go first. Uh, do you have any mo modified O&M or contingency plans to share, and I'm assuming it has to do with disinfection, at a treatment plant. Uh, yeah, I, I apologize. I don't know. I think I need a little more details to understand the question. Yeah, maybe, maybe uh, yeah, unfortunately. perspective. <laughs> so, Mr. Fisher, you wrote the question. If you could uh, jump in, we'll, we'll circle back to that one. Uh, the next question um, has to do with more of a filtration, a little bit less on the dis disinfection, but it, since it's feeding it. Um, the question is, what micron filtration is required to remove COVID-19, which we may not have an answer, but uh, didn't know if Brian or Andy, you would have a question on the, uh, an answer on that. Well, I'll start off. Uh, generally, we know that the tighter the membrane, such as the ultrafilters, have a smaller pore size than microfilters. And so generally when, you know, the, the, when the membranes are intact, they do remove more. And, and we've seen that in the drinking water world. Again, most of this work has been done years ago in the drinking water world because you had to get four log virus removal. So there's been a lot of studies in the clean water, drinking water, and now we're starting to look at the wastewater. So uh, just in general, I, I, I think everybody would agree, ultra filters are gonna be better. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, point uh, accurate response on the membrane systems. Uh, the pore size does matter in a tertiary membrane. Uh, I do wanna highlight that the MBR work, it's a different story because we are relying on the membrane as a barrier, but we're also relying on a biological process and a lot of solids capture and those viruses are within the solids. Um, so, so when we talk MBR, and there's still a lot of research that still needs to be done, it may not matter if it's a microfilter or an ultrafilter, um, but it, it really does appear to matter for a tertiary membrane. And, uh, and I wanna then take this all the way back to tertiary filters. 
uh, and not to disparage any type of filter in particular. Um, but if we are doing all these different types of conventional wastewater filters and our effluent turbidity is one NTU or 1.5 NTU, I would suggest there's a lot, still a lot of solids passing and you're not getting a lot of virus removal. If you're able to get those turbidities way down, targeting some really low turbidity numbers, which can happen, but it comes at a cost, an operational cost, uh, then you could be uh, through the use of coagulant and flocculating and grabbing particles that have the viruses enmeshed in them, then you, then you could be getting better removal. And so it's really a question about the chemical pretreatment than it is about the pore size of a tertiary uh, standard, uh, sorry, a standard media filter. Got it. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. Uh, next question, Brian. Uh, I think you answered it, but I just want to re you may, I want you to reiterate the answer. The question is, um, uh, what is the effective, uh, effective low dose UV on COVID-19? Well, in, in, in all cases, we, we are uh, following the National Water Research Institute MWRI UV guidance that if you have a media filter, uh, you need to be at a minimum dose of 100 millijoules per centimeter squared. That's that's what all the board permits say. Uh, and and it's, all, it's, it's what we have, have validated UV systems, most of them validated by Andy, by the way, to, to achieve that 100. Now, if you got a, any type of membrane, it's, it's lower to 80. You know, and that's been the standard for 20 years. Um, and so uh, if, if you're operating in another state at a lower dose, um, you, you can take a look at that dose response. And, uh, you know, if you're at 20, you may be only killing one log of virus. And I think most UV experts would agree about that. So get it a little Got higher. It. Got it. Okay. Excellent. Um, it is. I got, I'm going to do one more question. That'll be 1225 and then uh, we'll end up moving forward with uh, wrap up. Um, the question that came from a, um, during sign up for a register was there was a concern about COVID-19 in non-disaffected effluent. Um, per our poll question at the beginning of the session, there were a couple agencies without disinfection on the tail end. And the question from an audience member is, uh, it, should there be a concern? So, so I'd be happy to take the first uh, response to that. Uh, and and the, the truth of it is, is we, we don't fully know the answer as far, as far as the literature that I've read and the things I've seen. Um, but I'll repeat several things that I uh, have seen in the literature, again, which is that uh, as of yet, uh, they are not seeing they have not seeing culturable, viable virus in the effluent from a wastewater plant, a secondary process. Uh, the RNA studies that have been done, uh, for the most part, I have to check maybe all, but uh, a substantial amount of them are, are not even finding the RNA in the effluent. Uh, so, so the there is a primary question which looks fairly promising, the answer looks fairly promising right now, which is that there may not be viable uh, COVID-19 or, or COV, SARS-CoV-2 to be accurate uh, in the effluent from a wastewater plant before it gets tertiary treatment. Um, there are studies being done now to look at that. And uh, I, did, I did already uh, kind of forward promote Dan Garrity. Yeah, he is part of a large team that's trying to understand uh, that particular question of just are they in the effluent and are they viable? Um, and until we know that for sure, we can't really answer that question. I apologize. No apologies needed. We can't provide all the, all the answers. Brian, um, one of the questions that came up, could you state um, DDW's position with regards to replacement lamps, UV replacement lamps? Yes, so we, we believe strongly in California, whether it's drinking water or wastewater, that 
the lamp is a critical importance to the disinfected effectiveness of the disinfecting. You know, so the UV in any scenario is validated using certain equipment and certain hydraulics and all that. And so you have to operate with that original equipment unless you want to do a whole new validation study. And you're open to do that, but that's on your own dime to do a new. If you replace your bulbs with something that's not approved, uh, we, we have conditional approval letters that state this is the bulb that was used. And at the end of each letter, we say this is only accepted based upon the original equipment. If you replace it, then you're not really officially a Title 22 disinfection system. So I wanted to emphasize that's important to California. I'm sure a lot of other states would agree with that because the bulb is such an important thing. So I wanted to make that clear. Excellent. I appreciate the clarity.